welcome to Roundabout Oxford, a podcast from the University of Mississippi Libraries. Oxford, Mississippi is famous for its food culture. The home of the University of Mississippi is also the home of James Beard award-winning chefs, with restaurants specializing in everything from soul food to sushi. More and more Oxonians are growing their own food, too, taking full advantage of Lafayette County's humid climate and fertile soil. Today on Roundabout Oxford, we explore plants and gardening. Later, Stephanie Green of the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center sits down with our own Alex Watson to talk about the center's native plant sales. First, Master Gardeners Karen Trevillo and Nancy Kesselring discuss the work of the Master Gardeners Association and the services they provide to the local community. Here's Christina Streeter. So today I am here with Nancy Kesselring and Karen Trevillo, uh, who are part of the Lafayette County Master Gardeners Association. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, this particular organization and how people in Lafayette County can get involved. So Karen, I understand you're, you're vice president of the association, correct? That's correct. And you have been gardening for a while now. How long have you been gardening? I've actually been gardening my entire life. I, I started out following my grandmother around in her garden. And um, ever since then, I've just had a real interest in it. And I love planting flowers and watching things come to fruition. I enjoy designing landscapes and um, and actually learning the ins and outs, especially since we moved here, because it is a little bit different. I came from Houston, Texas, so a little bit different. Yes, I can completely relate to that. I came from Michigan and it's completely different soil, climate, everything's nothing's the same, practically. <laughs> um, and then Nancy, how, how long have you been gardening? Well, I've only been gardening about three years, and that's since I took the Master Gardener class and became a certified Master Gardener. I did not grow up with a gardening uh, family, except for my grandmothers, but I lived all over the country growing up and never lived close to either one of them, and they both lived here in Mississippi. But I remember when we'd come home to visit, one grandmother was a flower grower and the other one was a vegetable grower, and I loved being in the garden with them, but I was not around gardeners, so I'm a new gardener but loving it. Lovely. And I understand like, even though you consider yourself a novice, you're actually the president of the organization. So you must have a passion for helping lead. That's probably my strongest suit. Not, not as much the gardening, but uh, being a leader and just working with the organization and all the different people. As I said, I only took the class three years ago, but they're a great group of individuals and I've learned so much from each one of them and have enjoyed being a part of the group. They're a fun group too. They're a knowledgeable group and a fun group. Karen, you mentioned a little bit that you enjoy landscaping. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Well, it's just something that I started doing out of necessity. We paid to have the front of one of our first homes landscaped. Luckily, the guy was so nice. And I got out and watched everything he did from bed prep, to prepping the plants for planting, everything. And so then I did our backyard um, by myself. So um, it's just been kind of a kickoff from that point. And I have an art background, so I love design to begin with. And I love playing with the colors and textures and sizes of plants in relationship to the spaces where they go. So that's just my own personal passion. I enjoy that a lot. And Nancy, what kind of gardening are you most drawn to? Well, I have a small area that was, they ran out of sod when they landscaped our backyard. So it was just dirt and clay and a, a hot mess back there. So I've taken that small patch and then turning it into a pollinator garden. So it is kind of like I have figured out, this is the second year, I figured out what works, what doesn't work, what the deer won't eat uh, or maybe won't eat. And it's just a trial and error. So it's year number two, and I'm trying to add as many host plants and as many nectar plants as I can to that little garden space for the butterflies and the bees and the birds. So my thing that I'm working on now is a pollinator garden in my backyard. That's interesting. I think a lot of people don't realize just, I mean, obviously, if 
if you're a homeowner, you're probably aware that deer can do quite a bit. <laughs> they're beautiful creatures, but can do quite a bit of damage to fairly expensive shrubbery and plants and trees even. My question is, if you're dealing with deer, do you have a recommendation for people out there? Well, I'll tell you, I um, ran into this problem when we first bought our house six years ago. And it's really taken me four solid years to understand what's going on and what the deer will eat, what they won't eat at all, or what they will eat but will come back. And so I, we've actually done a presentation on this. You have to have some plants that they won't touch. And uh, I always try and make sure I put those in the front. I moved everything from our front yard that the deer would just absolutely decimate to our backyard. We put in a fence. But um, I have a whole list of plants that will do well, will add color and add texture, but the deer won't eat. And don't think just because you buy a deer resistant plant, what I found is our deer can't read. <laughs> So it's just been a real trial and error um, thing. And I, I always try something new every year just to see. I get a deer resistant plant and see if they'll eat it. And, I, you know, I had an, another one this year that they just decimated the first night I put it in. And so I moved those to the backyard and got something else to try there. So it's, it's always an evolving thing to see what they will and won't eat. I had to, I dug up 18 beautiful knockout rose bushes and I loved rose bushes and I dug up 18 knockout rose bushes from the front flower bed two years ago and planted lantana because they're not supposed to eat the lantana. And I haven't told Karen this yet, but I came out this morning and they nipped the tops off of them, but they just spit them out. So there yeah. were little tops laying around about four of those lantana this morning. So it's just part of the part of the problem yeah, but I love probably. the deer <laughs> <laughs> I mean they're beautiful and I think a lot of people maybe who um come to town think this is might be just an issue if you live out in the country but I live in town and um they're deer everywhere they usually just come out at night um but they're they're everywhere in town so um it's not just a a rural situation I think it was Nancy who talked about digging in that uh bed uh, when you first got involved in, in gardening and coming across um, what I'd like to consider my greatest nemesis here, uh, clay. I tried some different things. Uh, you know, I tried putting in peat moss when I planted some items. Does the soil just need to be amended with, with some garden soil? What, what sort of suggestions do you have with dealing with these sorts of conditions? I, I've, I ran into the same thing here. Um, our beds weren't prepared properly. And that's one thing when you're putting in a bed, preparation is everything for the success of that plant. Um, you have to make sure that the soil is porous enough that they're going to get water, but you don't want it to where it's soaked and their roots are constantly wet. So it's a real balancing act. What I've learned to do is um, we take out when we're planting anything new because my beds are existing. I can't just go back and take everything out at this point. But when we plant anything new, you want to dig your, your hole three times the size of your root ball to begin with. So when you take that out, my husband and I have gotten to where we put it in a wheelbarrow and we mix in. There's a lot of good commercial preparations available now at the big box stores and hardware stores. And we get one that's for whatever we're doing. So if we're putting in trees and shrubs, they actually have one that's recommended for trees and shrubs. And so we'll put that in at the base of the hole before we plant. And then we mix in the rest of it with the existing soil to really amend it and get it a nice, loose, crumbly texture and then put that back in. And we've had a lot of success with that. That's great advice. Um, Nancy, as president of the Master Gardener Association in this county, could you tell me a little bit more about like what is the actual purpose of this association and what might draw someone to become involved? 
We're a home horticultural program and a volunteer program, and we're actually part of the Mississippi State Extension Service. And the program started many years ago to help the extension agents with a lot of the issues that were coming up and questions that people had. And one county extension agent couldn't really take care of all of the issues in the county. So the Master Gardener program was started back in the 70s. And the Mississippi Master Gardener program was started in the early 90s. So we have uh, county organizations all over the state of Mississippi. And we're part of the Mississippi Master Gardener Association, but we fall under the umbrella of the Mississippi State Extension Service. A lot of our members are retirees. Um, I joined the group when I moved to town to meet people. I retired four years ago and I moved to town and wanted to keep my mind active and meet people and get involved in the community. And that's, that's everything about the Master Gardener program. We're involved in the community and different activities. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but it's been nice to meet people and also to keep my brain functioning. What drew you to the Master Gardeners Association, Karen? Oh, basically the same thing. Like I said, I've, I've had a love of gardening. Um, after I retired, I was traveling back and forth between our home in Texas and our home here in Mississippi and helping with grandchildren. And so I didn't actually take a course until two years ago to get certified as a master gardener. But it was a, a way to meet people and get involved in something that I loved. And um, it's really been a great experience. I can't say enough about the organization and the people in it. A lot of fun. It's um, just something that I find really enjoyable. So a lot of this really has to do with, you know, a person can, can have a beautiful garden, but a lot of this is really being educators. Is that correct? Correct. Educators and uh, volunteering and helping out in the community. We help out with different nonprofits with some of their landscaping issues or maintenance of their area, you know, pruning, weeding, giving them advice on their landscaping. So we have a lot of different organizations that we've worked with over the years and a lot of different activities that we're involved in. Great. And it looks like on your events calendar that you guys make pretty quick regular visits to the farmer's market. What happens there? We do. I'm not sure how long that program has been in existence, but we have a table set up at the farmer's market the first, third, and fifth Saturdays of the month from 8 to 11 from the time the market starts the beginning of May through the end of October. And at the market, we're there to answer questions that uh, customers of the market might have or citizens of the community might have. We also have publications from Mississippi State there to uh, hand out to people regarding their landscaping, their lawns, their gardens, anything and everything that they can think of that they might need. We have a table set up with all the different Mississippi State publications and just meeting the community and seeing what they need to have done. We have a home consult uh, program that we do. So we've had people stop by the farmer's market and express concerns with regard to a drainage issue in their yard, or they've recently moved to the community and they're wanting to know, you know, what type of bushes would do well in the, our environment and in their yard and landscaping, what kind of trees, what about their lawns, their soils, all the different questions that you kind of mentioned before. It's just like an amazing service. And I am familiar with Master Gardeners from when I lived in Michigan. And I mean, I just think, you know, nationally, even he here in the state, here in Lafayette County, you know, just what a great resource for people who are interested in either getting started or just have, you know, need help with troubleshooting. So I think that's just really amazing. Well, we appreciate you reaching out to us because it's important to the Master Gardeners that we have more visibility and that people understand what we do and what we can do and what we can provide to the community. Because I think a lot of people really don't know what the Master Gardeners do. Or a lot of people are overwhelmed thinking, oh, I can't be a Master Gardener. I don't know anything. It's too hard. They're intimidated by the coursework. And there's a final exam at the end of the course. But it is something worthwhile. And it's not as daunting as some people think it is. And I enjoyed all the technical aspects that you learn through the coursework. And it's all presented by professors at Mississippi State. It's really enjoyable and it really opens you up to a lot of things that even as a lifelong gardener, things that I didn't know or hadn't been uh, introduced to along the way. So 
So even if you're an absolute beginner, it's a great place to get started with being able to at least reach out to this association to maybe get some pointers on how to get started. And then if someone really uh, grows a passion for, for gardening, they can, they can move on to uh, maybe joining the association. So I had a chance to look at your event schedule on your website, and I actually noticed that there is a pruning workshop coming up. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yes, that pruning workshop is going to be September 28th at six o'clock, and it'll be held in Pontotoc, and it's sponsored by the Pontotoc County Master Gardener Association, and it's at the Pavilion in downtown Pontotoc. And Jeff McManus from Ole Miss is actually leading the seminar. He'll be the speaker for that seminar. And on the first, third, and fifth Saturdays of the month, we set up a table at the farmer's market. We're there to answer any questions that people might have regarding their gardening issues, their lawns, irrigation, whatever they might want to know about gardening, we're there to answer questions for them. And we also have publications free of charge from Mississippi State that we hand out uh, for the clients and the patrons at the farmer's market. And we also talk about the Master Gardener organization. And we take names and email addresses of anybody that might be interested in joining the Master Gardener program. That's wonderful. And there is a lecture series coming up, correct? Correct. That is in October. And it has in the past been in April, but with the pandemic, we moved it to October of this year. And it's the first three Thursdays in October at noon. And it'll be held at the Extension Office, which is over by the Lafayette County Arena. So it will be held in our office. It's at noon and last about an hour. And we have three different speakers this year. Dr. Guyton with Mississippi State, Uh, the gentleman from Dabney's Nursery in Olive Branch, and Alex Deason, who is also from Mississippi State. And they're going to be talking about native trees, insects, choosing landscape plants, a lot of different issues and a lot of different information. And if people want to learn more about Master Gardeners or um, find some of the resources that you spoke about, uh, where is the best way for people to learn more information? Well, our website is www.lcmga.org, and they can go on that website, and we have a calendar of events. We have different articles on there, uh, just well, all the upcoming things going on around our area, also in Union County, Lee County, and the state of Mississippi. And you're also on Facebook. People can follow you there. They sure can. We're at Lafayette County Master Gardeners Association. Hello, my name is Alex Watson. I am an associate professor and librarian at the J.D. Williams Library. Joining me today is Stephanie Green. Stephanie, why don't you tell me um, your job title and what you do? My name is Stephanie Green. I am the ecologist here at Strawberry Plains Audubon Center. And what that translates into in layman's term is I'm currently responsible for our, the land management of the acreage here at Strawberry Plains, the the habitat. And then also I handle our native plant nursery and our native plant um, sales that we do in the spring and the fall, along with um, some private landowner outreach and coordination with a lot of our local conservation organizations. Fantastic. Now, For those of us that aren't familiar with the Audubon Center, can you tell us a little bit about what it is and what it does? So Strawberry Plains is considered a sanctuary. Uh, We have about 3,000 acres and we are part of the National Audubon Society. Um, The land that the center sits on was actually donated by two sisters um, back in 1998. So we've been here about 22 years. Their intent when they donated it was that this would be a sanctuary for wildlife, and for oak forest habitats. And so we have tried to maintain that legacy and we do have the wildlife sanctuary and we manage for wildlife and plant species. We also do a lot of environmental education programming, especially on the weekends. Um, 
We do naturalist courses, children's camps, usually during the summer, and just a lot of different activities. And most people know, if they know anything about Strawberry Plains, the one thing that they do know us for is the Hummingbird Migration and Nature Festival that happens every uh, September, right at the peak of the fall migration for the ruby-throated hummingbirds. So uh, tell me more about the uh, Audubon Center's uh, native plant sale. How long has the native plant sale been going on? So we've um, had a native plant sale here at Strawberry Plains since about 2008. So it started fairly small and then each year it's grown both in size and also locations. So we started with just here on site and just a small quantity of plants and, and we've grown each year the number of plants that we sell and then also the locations. And so we have actually the past two years helped um, other centers in our region for the National Open Society to have native plant sales. We've helped supply plants to our Arkansas counterpart in Little Rock. And we've also this past year did um, some what we call our pop-up or satellite sales. We did two of those in Louisiana and then one of those in Nashville and one also in Grenada, Mississippi. Can you tell me a little bit about how you cultivate these plants? Because if I remember correctly, these are, these are wilder plants. Yeah, so we do a mix of different cultivation strategies. So a good majority of the plants that we sell at our native plant sale are we order in as what's called liners or they're small plugs and small plants that have already been grown up and propagated by, um, by other reputable nurseries and companies that specialize in native plants. And then we take those, pop them up, and then grow them out to the sizes that we sell. And that may be a quart size or a gallon or three gallon or even bigger. Um, and the reason we do that is that helps us, A, it helps us source these native plants. And then it makes sure that the plants that we're giving to the customers are in good shape and ready to go right in the ground. The other way um, that we propagate a lot of our plants, we do some propagations from cutting from here on site at Strawberry Plains. We've done that in the past couple of years with some of our shrubs like oak leaf hydrangeas and other species. We also do some propagation from seed that's more time intensive, but we have started doing more of that and we hope to continue that into the future. And then we also have some growers that grow up a lot of our trees and shrub. There are some native plant nurseries and growers that specialize just wholesale and they specialize in native shrubs and trees. And so we use them because to grow up a shrub or a tree to the point where it's ready to sell to the public takes a little bit more time and investment. And so we do tend to order those ready to go. Well, why don't you tell me about some of the native plants that the Audubon Center sells, maybe some of your favorite plants and why they're your favorites. This is always a really hard question because it's kind of like your favorite child. Which one do you pick, right? Um, I'm a pushover for bright colors and pretty flowers, which I think a lot of people are when it comes to their gardening and, and around their houses. But so a couple of my favorites are the lavender bee balm, which is a really pretty soft purple uh, flower. That's a great pollinator flower. Um, they're just starting to bloom right now. They get pretty tall, so they're great for like back of borders in a sunny or more of a naturalized garden spot. But the bumblebees and all the other native pollinators love them. One of my other favorites is a cardinal flower, which um, the scientific name is Lobelia cardinalis. And it gets this tall stalk of bright red flowers. And it's a favorite in the kind of mid to late summer for ruby-throated hummingbirds. As we know, hummingbirds love those reds and pinks. They'll cue on a bunch of different colors, but they really like red. The interesting thing with a lot of, if you look around, a lot of our native plants aren't red flowered. And, and that's because a lot of pollinators don't actually pick up on the color red, but ruby throated hummingbirds do. And there's a few butterflies that do. So I like the cardinal flower. It's a really just bright red. And then right now along the roadside, you'll see a lot of tick seeds or, um, Black Eyed Susans are blooming. They're another one of my favorite. Like I said, that bright yellow, those pops of colors that the pollinators really like. Now, here's the real question. Do cardinals, northern cardinals, actually like cardinal flowers? I don't think that they, I'm sure they appreciate them for their uh, color, because who doesn't look in the mirror and appreciate things that look like themselves, right? <laughs> but I think they... Um, they wouldn't eat the seeds of cardinal flower because when you start to collect cardinal flower seeds, they are like these little teeny tiny 
seeds. So they wouldn't be eating the seeds. So they're more of a nectar source for pollen pollinators and for hummingbirds. Um, the name cardinal, it, it, the cardinal flower, it comes from that bright red color and harkens back to like, you know, the cardinals and in, in kind of Catholic traditions. And that's where that common name comes from. So cardinal flowers are Lobelia cardinalis, but then there's the great blue um, Lobelia, which is in the same family. And it looks fairly similar, but it has a bluish purple flower. So if you're not into red, you can still get a Lobelia and have it have these really pretty blue purple colors. Sounds like the indigo bunting flower in that case. So um, what are some ways that people can get involved with um, native plants and these, uh, these plants that are great for pollinators, even if they don't have a huge garden and they're not um, a super gardener? There's lots of ways you can get involved. And one of the best ways is to just be a champion of native plants in those landscaped areas. Like we've all driven around our hometowns or even campuses and seen where, you know, they change out the landscaping and, and it looks really pretty. But if you get close, you realize like that it's they're not natives. And there's ways where you can get involved with your local municipalities and, and ask them to uh, create ordinances where they'll do their best or that they require that a certain percentage of the landscaping plants be native species. There's also um, ways as simple as just, you know, really support those growers that are producing and growing and selling native plants. Um, so that even if you're not buying a lot to put in and you're not this, you know, master gardener, that, um, but that the resources are there because right now it, it is a supply and demand type of situation. There's not a lot of people that grow a lot of native plants. And if the demand was there, then you would see more of these bigger growers start producing those native plants. And they're important to our wildlife and not just pollinators, but they're important to birds. So, so I would say just being a champion and then just start small. Like you don't have to have a really bright green thumb in order to grow natives. That's the great thing about a lot of our native species is that once you get them established, they don't take a lot of work. I mean, that's what makes them kind of like they're native. So they're used to our habitats. They're used to our climates. They're used to our soil types. As long as you put them in the right soil, the right place, they'll do great once they're established. And you can kind of just stand back and not have to worry about them. You don't have to constantly fertilize or tend to them. So I would encourage anybody, if you're not a gardener, start small, you know, get one flower pot and put, you know, a Stokes Aster or a uh, Homestead, you know, Verbena, which is this bright purple flower. And, um, and you'll learn pretty quickly that it doesn't take a lot of effort. Fantastic. If someone wanted to uh, support the Audubon Center's native plant sale, I know we just had one. Uh, when is the next one? So we will actually have our native plant sale for the fall. We usually do that in conjunction with the Hummingbird Migration and Nature Festival. So if you come to the festival, which is gonna be September 11th and 12th, you could come, you could do all the events in the festival and then also go down to the nursery and purchase as many native plants as you want. So that's our next opportunity um, for people to, to buy the native plants and kind of help support your native wildlife and birds by putting those in your yard instead of our non-native crepe myrtles and, and, you know, all the other pretty landscape plants that we see way more of than our native species. But if anybody wants to purchase some plants and they can't make it to the fall festival, they're welcome to contact me here at Strawberry Plains and as long as I can steal away from whatever else I'm doing and we can kind of set up a time, I'm more than willing to meet someone down in the nursery and let them look and see what we have. Fantastic. That's, uh, that's very generous of you. Is there anything else, any closing remarks or wisdom that you would like to, uh, to impart to finish us out here? I guess I just wanted to go back to like the why. Why do we care about natives versus, you know, a tropical or, or uh, an exotic species? And um and, and I like to kind of boil it down to a really simple thing. So native plants. So on native plants, you have native bugs. And if you have native bugs, then you're going to have your native birds in your wildlife. And, and that sounds kind of counterintuitive. If you're a, a landscaper or a gardener, you're like, well, I don't want bugs in my garden or my landscape. But by creating these kind of exotic, non-native landscapes, aka our yards and our subdivisions, we've effectively removed these um, what, what our birds and our wildlife species and insect species would consider their buffets. 
And so if you're a bird that's just returned from a winter in the tropics or in South America, and you just flew over the Gulf, a five hour nonstop flight, if not more, like more than five hours and 500 miles across the Gulf and you hit the Southern coast of Mississippi and you start trucking North, you want to be able to know that as you go, your pit stops where you stop and you refuel and you get water and you get food are there. And what better way to do that and invite those species into your backyard than by planting native species, native plants that are going to have their food sources on them, whether that's seeds or caterpillars and in different books. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for um, donating your time to speak with us today. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Roundabout Oxford was developed and produced by Brian Corrigan, Taylor Fields, Alan Munchauer, Abigail Norris, Christina Streeter, and Alex Watson. This episode was narrated by Brian Corrigan and Gail Herrera. Thank you for listening to Roundabout Oxford.